All right, so you're thinking about retirement and you've got some info about CDs. You know they're considered safe, especially with those rates topping 5% right now, which is pretty tempting. But here's the thing. You're playing the long game with retirement. Safe doesn't always equal the best growth. You want your money working as hard as you are, right? That's the key. A CD is like parking your money in a comfy chair for a set time. It earns a little interest, sure, but it's not exactly sprinting towards a big finish line. And that's where this deep dive gets interesting. We're looking at how to turn that comfy chair into a rocket ship for your retirement savings. Love that analogy. And you've sent over some fascinating articles about alternatives to CDs, from S&P 500 ETFs and target date funds to even real estate. So let's unpack why a different strategy might be needed for long-term goals like retirement. When we're talking retirement, we're talking decades. And over decades, even small differences in returns can mean tens of thousands of dollars more or less yeah. in your nest egg. It's not just about earning interest. It's about outpacing inflation. Okay. So remind me again why inflation is public enemy number one when it comes to retirement planning. Think of it like this. Imagine you've got $10,000 tucked away, enough to buy, say, a year's worth of groceries today. But inflation means that next year, those same groceries will cost a little bit more. Maybe it's $10,300. Now your $10,000 hasn't vanished. It's just lost some of its buying power. If your savings aren't growing faster than the price of groceries is increasing, you're actually losing ground. CBs with their fixed returns often struggle to keep up with inflation over long periods. It's like running up a down escalator. You're putting in the effort, but not getting as far as you need to. Exactly. And that's why for retirement, we need to think about investments that have the potential to not just keep pace with inflation, but to actually beat it. So let's talk about one of those potential rocket ships you mentioned, the S&P 500 ETF. For our listener who's maybe not super familiar with this, can you break down exactly what it is and how it works? Absolutely. Let's start with ETFs in general. Imagine you want to invest in stocks. But instead of picking individual companies, you want a diversified portfolio that reflects the overall market. That's where ETFs come in. They're like baskets of stocks bundled together. And you could buy and sell them on the stock exchange. So instead of betting on one company, you're spreading your bet across a whole bunch of them. Exactly. And the S&P 500 is a specific index that tracks 500 of the largest U.S. companies. So an S&P 500 ETF is essentially giving you a slice of ownership in each of those 500 companies, all in one neat little package. Why is that good for someone looking to grow their retirement savings? Well, the S&P 500 has historically delivered an average annual return of about 10%. Now I know what you're thinking. 10%. Is that really enough to make a difference? But consider this. Over the long haul, even a small difference in return can have a huge EE impact on your final nest egg. Let's say you need $1 million to retire comfortably. With a 5% return from a CD, you'd need to save significantly more each month compared to a 10% return from an S&P 500 ETF. That's the power of compounding, where you're not just earning interest on your initial investment, but also on the interest you've already earned. It's like that snowball effect. The longer it rolls, the bigger it gets. Precisely. And remember, this is a long-term game. While there will be ups and downs in the market, the S&P 500 has shown consistent growth over time. Plus, many S&P 500 ETFs have really low expense ratios, meaning the fees you pay are minimal, making more of that growth work for you. So potentially higher returns than CDs, the magic of compounding working in your favor. Andy, low fees. Sounds like a win-win-win situation. But of course, nothing is without risks. How do S&P 500 ETFs compare to CDs in terms of predictability? You're right. With a CD, you know exactly what you're getting. Your money is guaranteed. And your return is fixed. But with an S&P 500 ETF, your return is tied to the performance of the stock market, which can fluctuate. So it's a trade-off. Potentially higher returns come with potentially more volatility. Exactly. It comes down to your risk tolerance. For someone who can't stomach the thought of their investments going up and down a CD might feel more comfortable. But for someone who understands that the stock market has historically trended upwards over time and is willing to ride out some bumps along the way, an S&P 500 ETF might be a better fit for reaching those long-term retirement goals. Makes sense. Now let's talk about another option that seems to be gaining popularity, target date funds. I feel like these are often marketed as the set it and forget it solution for retirement savings. They are, and for good reason. They're designed to simplify investing for people who don't want to spend their time researching individual stocks or bonds. Okay, so break it down for me. How do target date funds actually work? Well, imagine you're aiming to retire in, say, 2050. You choose a target date fund with that year in its name, a 2050 fund. Inside that fund, there's a mix of investments. 
typically stocks and bonds. When you're younger and further away from retirement, the fund will lean more heavily on stocks for growth potential. As you get closer to your target date, the fund automatically starts shifting towards a more conservative mix, increasing the proportion of bonds to help protect your savings. It's like having a personal investment manager who adjusts your portfolio based on your age and how much time you have left until retirement. So it takes the guesswork out of figuring out how to allocate your investments. And where do you typically find these target date funds? You'll often find them within 401k plans, which are retirement savings accounts offered by employers. They're usually a default investment option, making it easy to get started. But even if your employer doesn't offer a 401k or you're looking for more options, you can find target date funds through various brokerage firms as well. So they're readily available and designed to be pretty hands-off. But are there any downsides to this set it and forget it approach? You know, we have to be sure to look at all sides of the coin. I'm glad you brought that up. That's a great point. While target date funds offer convenience and diversification, you do have less control over the specific investments within the fund. You're essentially trusting the fund managers to make the best decisions for you based on their preset strategy. So it's like choosing a pre-selected meal plan. Convenient, but you might not get to pick and choose every ingredient. Exactly. And it's important to do your research and compare different target date funds. Look at their historical performance fees and investment strategy to make sure it aligns with your risk tolerance and retirement goals. Good reminder. Okay, we've talked about stocks and bonds, but what about real estate? It's a popular investment, but it can also feel intimidating, especially compared to something like an ETF. What's fascinating here is that you can actually invest in real estate without needing to buy properties, become a landlord, or deal with tenants. And that's where REITs, or Real Estate Investment Trusts, come in. REITs. All right. I'm intrigued. Explain what those are and why they might be a good option for someone looking to diversify their retirement portfolio. Think of REITs as companies that own and operate income-producing real estate, like office buildings, shopping malls, or apartment complexes. And here's the key. They trade on the stock market just like any other stock. You could essentially buy a piece of a skyscraper or a shopping center without having to actually manage the property yourself. Exactly. And you get to participate in the potential appreciation of those properties and benefit from the rental income they generate. And here's where it gets really interesting. Historically, REITs have actually outperformed the S&P 500 over the past 50 years. They've delivered an average annual return of about 12.7% compared to the S&P 500's 10.2%. Wow, that's significant. So real estate, even through REITs, has the potential to be a powerful engine for retirement savings growth. Absolutely. And it speaks to the importance of diversification. Different asset classes like stocks, bonds, and real estate tend to perform differently in different economic conditions. By spreading your investments across these different asset classes, you're potentially smoothing out your returns over time. Like having a well-balanced investment portfolio. But what about traditional real estate, buying actual properties? I'm curious to know your take on that as a retirement investment strategy. Now, traditional real estate is a different animal altogether. It has the potential for significant rewards, but it also comes with a unique set of challenges. Okay, let's dive into the pros and cons of traditional real estate. What makes it potentially appealing for retirement savings, but what are some of the things to be aware of before jumping in? So we've explored these different investment vehicles, and it's clear they each have their own pros and cons, but I'm curious for our listener who might be thinking, okay, this all sounds great in theory, but how do I actually get started? Let's shift gears and get into the practical aspects of investing. Let's start with those S&P 500 ETFs. What are the first steps someone would take to actually invest in one? It's surprisingly straightforward. It all begins with opening a brokerage account. Think of it like a bank account, but specifically designed for buying and selling investments like stocks and ETFs. Okay, so you open a brokerage account. What then? How do you actually find and buy those S&P 500 ETFs? There are so many out there. It can feel overwhelming. Don't worry. It's easier than you think. Most brokerage platforms these days are incredibly user-friendly. They have search functions where you can look up specific ETFs by name or ticker symbol. For instance, if you are interested in a popular S&P 500 ETF like IVV or VOO, Ugh. you can simply type that into the search bar and boom, there it is. And once you've found the ETF you want, is it as simple as clicking buy and entering how much you want to invest? Pretty much. You decide how many shares you want to purchase, place the order, and that's it. You're officially an ETF investor. And the great thing is you don't need a huge sum of money to get started. Many ETFs have share prices under $100. 
and some platforms even allow you to buy fractional shares. I've heard that term before, fractional shares, but I'm not entirely sure what it means. It's a game changer for smaller investors. Essentially, it means you can buy a portion of a share if you don't have enough money to buy a whole one. So even if you only have 50 or $100 to invest, you can still get a piece of the action. It makes building a diversified portfolio much more accessible. So no more excuses about not having enough money to invest. Okay, that's really helpful for understanding the S&P 500 ETF side of things. Now, what about target date funds? Where do those fit into the picture, practically speaking? As we mentioned, target date funds are often found within 401k plans, those employer-sponsored retirement savings accounts. If you're lucky enough to have a 401k through your job, chances are they offer target date funds as an investment option. In fact, they might even be the default choice for those who don't want to actively manage their investments. That makes sense. But what if you don't have access to a 401k or you want to explore more options? Can you invest in target date funds outside of that employer-sponsored structure? Absolutely. Many brokerage firms offer a wide selection of target date funds, and the process for buying them is very similar to buying ETFs. You search for the specific fund based on your target retirement year, decide how much you want to invest, and place the order. Technology has made investing so much more accessible and user-friendly, which is fantastic. Agreed. Now let's pivot to real estate. We've talked about REITs as a way to tap into real estate without actually owning properties. But how does one go about investing in REITs? Is it similar to buying stocks or ETFs? You got it. REITs trade on stock exchanges. So the process is exactly the same as buying any other stock through your brokerage account. No need to hunt for properties, deal with real estate agents, or worry about tenants. You can get exposure to the real estate market with a few clicks. That's the beauty of these investment vehicles. They've really opened up opportunities for people to participate in markets that were once much harder to access. But I know there are listeners out there who are drawn to the more hands-on approach of traditional real estate, buying and managing properties themselves. What advice would you give to someone who's considering going down that path? Look, traditional real estate is a whole different ballgame. It can be a great wealth building tool. Mm -hmm. But it's not something to jump into lightly. It requires a different mindset, a willingness to be hands-on, and of course, a good understanding of the market and the process. Okay, let's break it down. What are some crucial first steps for someone who's intrigued by traditional real estate but maybe doesn't know where to begin? Education is key. Before diving into any investment, especially something as significant as real estate, it's crucial to do your homework. Read books, articles, listen to podcasts, like this one, of course, attend seminars. And most importantly, talk to experienced real estate investors. Learn about the different strategies involved, the potential risks, and the legal and financial aspects. This knowledge will be your foundation for making informed decisions. So it's not just about finding a property you like and jumping in. There's a whole learning curve involved. Absolutely. Real estate is not a passive investment. Mm. It requires active involvement, a willingness to learn, and a certain comfort level with taking on risks. Once you've got that foundation of knowledge, what's the next step? Define your investment strategy. What type of real estate are you most interested in? Residential properties like single family homes or apartment buildings, commercial properties like office spaces or retail shops, or maybe you're drawn to the idea of flipping houses, buying properties, renovating them and selling them for a profit. So you need to have a vision for what you want to achieve with your real estate investments. Precisely. And that vision should align with your overall financial goals risk tolerance, and the amount of time and energy you're willing to commit. Each strategy comes with its own set of considerations. For example, if you're looking at rental properties, you need to research local rental markets, understand landlord-tenant laws, and be prepared to handle property management tasks. If flipping houses is more your style, you'll need to develop skills in property valuation, renovation, and marketing. It sounds like there are a lot of moving parts to consider. There are. And that's why it's so crucial to do your research and, if needed, seek guidance from experienced professionals, like real estate agents, attorneys, or financial advisors who specialize in real estate investing. Oh. They can provide valuable insights and help you navigate the complexities. So once you've got your knowledge base and a clear strategy in mind, what's next on the checklist? It's time to talk about the elephant in the room, financing. Before you start scouting properties, you need to assess your financial situation and determine how you're going to pay for your real estate investments. That's a crucial point. Real estate often requires a significant upfront investment. Exactly. You need to consider things like your down payment, closing costs, and potential ongoing expenses like property taxes, insurance, and maintenance. If you're planning to finance the purchase with a mortgage, you'll need to get pre-approved by a lender 
to know how much you can borrow. So it's about being realistic about your financial capacity and making sure you're not overextending yourself. Absolutely. Real estate can be a powerful wealth building tool, but it's important to approach it with a level head and a solid financial plan. Okay, let's say you've done your research, defined your strategy, and you're confident in your financing. Now you're ready to start looking for properties. What advice would you give to someone who's at that stage of the game? This is where the excitement really kicks in. Start by researching different neighborhoods and markets that align with your investment strategy. For example, if you're looking for rental properties, you'll want to find areas with high rental demand, low vacancy rates, and good potential for appreciation if you're flipping houses. You'll be looking for properties in up-and-coming neighborhoods that you can purchase at a discount, renovate strategically, and sell for a profit. So it's all about finding those hidden gems, those properties with untapped potential. Exactly. But it's not just about the property itself, it's also about the location. Consider factors like proximity to schools, parks, transportation, and other amenities that make a neighborhood desirable for renters or buyers. It sounds like location is key no matter what type of real estate investing you're pursuing. So let's say you found a property that checks all the boxes. What happens next? It's time to make an offer. This is where working with an experienced real estate agent can be invaluable. They can help you craft a competitive offer, negotiate with the seller, and navigate the legal and logistical aspects of the transaction. So it's like having a skilled negotiator on your side to help you secure the best deal possible. Exactly. And once your offer is accepted, you'll enter a phase called escrow, where all the details are finalized. This typically involves inspections, appraisals, title searches, and a lot of paperwork. It sounds like a process with a lot of moving parts. It can be. But your real estate agent and closing attorney will guide you through each step, ensuring everything is in order before you reach the finish line. Closing day. And that's the day you officially become a property owner. It's a great feeling. But remember, the journey doesn't end there. If you're a landlord, you'll need to find tenants, manage the property, handle repairs, and collect rent. If you're flipping houses, you'll need to oversee renovations, market the property, and find a buyer. So it's an ongoing commitment, not a passive investment by any means. Exactly. Traditional real estate requires active involvement, ongoing learning, and adaptability to market changes. It's not for everyone. But for those who are prepared and passionate, it can be a rewarding path to building wealth. Well, we've covered a lot of ground today, from those super simple S&P 500 ETFs to the more complex world of real estate. It's clear there are many paths to explore when it comes to building retirement savings that go beyond just CDs. And that's what's so exciting about personal finance. There's no one-size-fits-all approach. It's about finding the right fit for you, your goals, your risk tolerance, and your lifestyle. So as we wrap up this deep dive, what are some key takeaways you hope our listener will remember as they consider their own retirement planning journey? First and foremost, don't be afraid to think beyond the traditional. CDs have their place. But for long-term growth, you might need to step outside that comfort zone. Right. Sometimes taking a calculated risk is the best way to reach your full potential. Exactly. And secondly, diversification is key. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Spreading your investments across different asset classes can help smooth out those ups and downs and potentially lead to more consistent returns over time. It's like building a strong foundation with different building blocks, each playing a role in supporting the overall structure. Love that analogy. Mm. And lastly, never underestimate the power of time. The earlier you start investing, the more time you have to let compounding work its magic. It's like that saying, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, the second best time is today. The same applies to investing. Absolutely. Even small, consistent contributions can grow into a significant nest egg over time, thanks to the power of compounding. This has been such an insightful conversation. Thank you for sharing your expertise and helping to demystify these different investment options. It's been a pleasure. And remember, the journey to financial freedom is a marathon, not a sprint. Keep learning, keep exploring, and most importantly, keep taking steps toward your financial goals. Well said. And to our listener, thank you for joining us on this deep dive. We hope you feel empowered to make informed decisions and create a retirement plan that aligns with your vision for the future. Until next time, happy investing.